So thank you everyone for, uh, for coming and, uh, and finding uh, your seat. We're just gonna, we're just gonna go for it actually, yeah. So I'm uh, Sean Braithwaite and this is Peter Bergen. And uh, the title of our talk is Emergent Distributed Architectures, Microservices and Data Pipelines. So people talk about architectural decisions with no sense of objective value. We have a plethora of blog posts now about how big companies transition to microservices, but often what's missing is somehow the motivation over why. And after you invested all these resources into performing such a substantial transition, you know, how do you know you got your money's worth? So we hope then to introduce a language or some kind of analytical framework to help answer these questions. And I think these questions are quite important because architectural decisions are uh, really expensive. They happen rarely. The outcomes are difficult to interpret and also difficult to attribute to any of its potential causes. We often fo focus too much on the how, you know, how to install Hadoop, how to set up Kubernetes. Uh, as engineers, I think we really love these types of questions. We love knowing how to do these things and improving our code craft. We often focus too little on why and when. Why should we build a click tracking pipeline? When should we migrate our monolith to microservices? As an engineer, uh, we often avoid these questions because they're ambiguous, nuanced, and can even be political. So the topic of this talk is then trying to answer these why and when questions for two different kinds of distributed architectures that occur frequently. And actually, they have a lot in common. But first, to do that, we need to zoom out and look at the way that we think about the interactions of teams and software organizations, and of course, the software artifacts that they build. Right, so uh, rather than the oft-repeated and hackneyed uh, car analogy, we'd like to propose a model of a software organization as uh, a living organism. The organism is driven by its own sort of biological imperative, I suppose which is the fulfillment of its business functions, whatever they may be. And this organism is composed of distinct and cooperating uh, subcomponents like organs or, cell or cells, which are its teams. Cells exist within the greater organism and they have life cycles. That is, they form oriented by some kind of objective or mandate. Uh, they expand, adding composite parts and taking on responsibilities and they collapse eventually, uh, returning resources to the surrounding body. Each cell has a natural membrane, a sort of boundary that divides the internal from the external. Internal work tends to be more efficient as it's localized. Knowledge can be shared with high bandwidth and uh, high frequency, whereas external work, uh, in contrast, is more expensive. It requires interaction either uh, over or through this boundary, this membrane. It's abstracted and necessarily coordinated. So organisms have multiple cells, actually, to enable a form of parallelism. They partition work and they operate independently. Coordination between cells or organs is expensive, uh, but necessary, and so ideally minimized. All of these properties are paralleled by teams in an organization. Teams are formed around an objective and grow or shrink in size as the business requires. Teams have boundaries, developing their own sort of efficient uh, pidgin languages internally and bearing the costs of coordination externally. Observe that the time and energy that teams spend coordinating is time and energy that they don't have to fulfill their individual goals. But coordination costs can be amortized when incentives are aligned. For example, two feature teams coordinating a release can uh, minimize friction if they have a shared vision of the user experience that they're trying to enable. In contrast, coordination is painful when incentives are malaligned. For example, if that feature team wants to release features but must coordinate deployment with an operations team, or if the same team wants to release features but doesn't want to wait for the results of an A-B test, we have problems. This sort of malalignment leads to local maximums, I think, uh, when one team succeeds at the expense of another. And the result is invariably that the organization as a whole suffers. If an organism's immune defense systems, uh, in comparison, uh, are too good at what they do, then the consequences can be an autoimmune disease, for example. 
So a few, uh, I think, important observations. Um, we split teams and cells in order to enable this parallelism or this parallel pursuit of higher order goals. An organism, just as an organization, needs to do these different things at different times if it has any chance of uh, achieving these goals. And the individual, best, uh, the individual interest of any single cell right, is somehow diminished in this context. It's really the global best interest of the organism that we're concerned with. So we've established a few natural uh, tensions already. These tensions are annoying, but are a product of our need to develop uh, software and organizations in parallel. So there's one, the, the tension between team level goals and the organizational imperative, so this global versus local maxima. The tension between inward facing work, fulfilling uh, specific goals, and then out for, outward facing work, which is somehow the direct consequence of coordination. So natural tensions, of course, they can't be resolved. They can only be acknowledged, managed, and at best balanced. To do that sort of work, there aren't really silver bullets. There are just tools and frameworks that help us make better decisions. I personally like to think uh, of bounded context as one of these tools. Bounded contexts are defined as a single common language shared by people collaborating. So people use words, and the meaning of those words is quite important. As an organization grows, specifically uh, words and language, specifically nouns, uh, take on different meanings to different people. As an example, this idea of a, a user might be a label used by different feature teams. But it's possible that those two features have completely different demographics. When describing some expectation about an average user, um, even if the teams are using the same noun, their expectations will rightfully differ. Bounded contexts uh, emerge naturally and are a good way to help a team focus. They're a way for a team to even define themselves and the work that they do. Like a cell membrane, they promote cooperation and comprehension within the system through two main mechanisms. So one, they reduce the coordination costs by clearly defining a surface area of interaction, so the interfaces become more clear. And two, they make internal work more efficient by giving team members a shared and closed vocabulary. And whether or not you do it explicitly, bounded contexts are bound to form. Any group of people working closely together is naturally going to establish their own cult language and conventions. So that's great. Uh, we're not inventing some alien thing here. Uh, we're just identifying, reifying, and improving something that's already there. So let's continue with that. Yeah, so another thing we know is that software organizations produce artifacts sort of concomitant with the team structure. This is called Conway's Law, which I guess we're all generally familiar with. And organizations are free to define that structure however they want. Uh, in fact, I think organizations are responsible for defining that structure to suit their purposes, to produce the most suitable artifacts for their goals, for their mandates. Uh, the bounded context, as we saw, is a sort of formalization of a naturally occurring process of team unity, right? Uh, it gives us a framework and even a mandate to improve how we think and speak about our business domain. Similarly, Conway's law is a formalization of the natural, naturally occurring process of software manufacturing. It gives us a framework and, I'm going to argue, even a mandate uh, to improve how we produce software artifacts. And it is a process. That is, software artifacts and teams that make them are like cells constantly producing, changing, evolving. The key thing is the dimension of time, right? Nothing in a software organization is static. This is more like gardening than intelligent design in the whole. Uh, gardening is a process, whereas intelligent design is an act. So we have the organization as a whole as an organism. We have the teams as cells. We have the software artifacts as their output, their exhaust, all of this as a process. So let's talk about now the specific forms that output tends to take. And I guess this is the thesis of the talk, in a sense, that certain architectures uh, are naturally emergent in the modern organization. So first, we have the microservices uh, pattern, which I think is increasingly common. And there, it's increasingly common in large part because we've seen a lot of success stories. Uh, Amazon famously pioneered, I think, the service-oriented architecture model, enabling, at the time, there were, what, like, several thousand engineers 
uh, to move the ball forward in a famously heterogeneous, even schizophrenic product org. Um, this was back in, I guess, around 2009 when they started talking about this publicly. Uh, then Netflix and to some degree SoundCloud took up uh, the mantle and pioneered the modern microservices paradigm, I think, uh, enabling them to punch sort of well above their weight class in terms of market share per uh, developer headcount. And this was in like 2011, 2012 or so. And from these sorts of success stories, and there were many more, uh, we take as engineers the, the virtue of microservices as sort of axiomatic, right? Uh, and then we shift the conversation almost deceptively quickly to the implementation details. And that conversation feels meaningful, right? Because there's a lot of ground to cover in that space. And as we've already sort of observed, um, engineers are all too eager to take up that uh, question and to answer the how, right? We're very happy about that. How should we do microservices? Well, probably Kubernetes, yeah, sure. Um, and we'll need continuous deployment, of course. So we've got Spinnaker over here, and it's built on top of uh, Jenkins over there, which was built on top of the uh, build scripts that last year's interns uh, threw together. And we have three different console deployments, running three different versions, of course, backing up four different custom caching systems. In half a year, your 15 engineers, or whatever, have deployed 50 or 60 microservices, nanoservices, oops. Um, so let's take quite a large and explicit step back. When and why should we opt into this architecture? Or more artfully, when and why does a microservice architecture naturally emerge? What is its ideal form? To answer this, we should see what microservices actually do for us. And I'd like to convince you that microservices actually introduce more technical problems than they solve. Remember that each microservice models a bounded context, ideally. It, it owns its own domain models, and so has its own vocabulary. It owns its own persistence layer, ideally. So it has its own sort of partial technology stack, in a sense. Shared databases in the microservices architecture are strictly forbidden, right? You shouldn't do it. This means that microservices necessarily and correctly duplicate infrastructure in the, in the aggregate. But this brings huge and kind of obvious problems of efficiency, right? So infrastructural concerns must be sort of uniform and automated if you're going to make sense of this. Bootstrapping a new service must follow some sort of defined model, some sort of skeleton framework. Um, building and deploying code must be automated to some degree. Your observability stack needs to be standardized, probably, thorough, definitely, uh, and accessible to new developers and people triaging this uh, complex system that you've accidentally created. And some of these things that I'm enumerating, they can be done post hoc uh, with some degree of pain. It's definitely true. So it's possible to start with building manually, even on developer laptops, say, and shipping artifacts somewhere. And over time, you can add automation to that and standardize a pipeline. Um, maybe over months or years, it's possible. It's also possible to do manual scheduling of services onto your, uh, onto your fleet somewhere. Uh, and you can introduce a cluster scheduler once you've figured out the uh, the model that you want to use or once you've reached a certain size, that's also true. But it's a lot harder to get by without good monitoring from day one. And if you don't have any infrastructural automation at all in place um, before launching your architecture, then it's going to be effectively impossible to run. These are hard learned lessons, right? So this all seems quite awful, and in fact it is. Um, but opting into all these degrees of pain actually solves certain problems, principally I would like to argue that microservices codify and in consequence reify the responsibilities of the teams that produce them. This in turn enables faster and more efficient communication between teams. So by modeling coordination as we've discussed as between cells or teams or software uh, as service contracts, which is what microservices force you to do, uh, it's actually supremely effective and efficient. Specs, right? They're great. Uh, SLOs are great because they give us a concrete and explicit vocabulary to describe these interactions. It also improves communication within a team, I'd like to argue, because a thicker cell wall makes clear what is and isn't in scope. I mean this in terms of both business needs, like uh, what should we actually be working on in our team, but also in terms of people, like who are the stakeholders in my uh, area of interest? Are they coming to my meetings? Are they using the same language that I am? So this all together promotes sort of a virtuous cycle, in my opinion, a clear mandate, a clear vocabulary, and technical autonomy in a given microservice team uh, maximizes traction, right? And with maximum traction, we have maximum product velocity. 
There's another interesting consequence here related to autonomy, I think. Thicker cell walls emphasize the costs of dependencies on others. So to maximize autonomy, teams naturally are aiming to reduce those dependencies. This gives rise to what you see called sometimes the vertical team. Has anyone heard of this like idea of the vertical product team, probably, maybe? Um, so in short, top to bottom, user interface to database, or maybe even to networking layer, uh, this team is formed in this vertical orientation and is naturally cross-disciplinary. Compare this, uh, in contrast, against the horizontal team, which would be single disciplinary. That is, you would have the iOS team, and then you would have the middleware team, and then you would have the MySQL team or the networking team. Uh, observe that the vertical teams own complete features, as defined by the bounded context of a given microservice or a product, uh, product feature. Um, these things are aligned with business requirements, right? Uh, which, in turn, can ship without coordination, external coordination between units. Whereas features in a horizontal organization necessarily have uh, like n touch points, right? They require n-way coordination. Optimizing for autonomy, then, in this sense, um, yields both local and global maxima, as we described earlier. So the key observation here that I'd like to claim is that all solved problems in this architecture relate to improved and typically more efficient communication, um, mostly communication between teams. That is, service and API contracts make behavioral expectations clear, reducing disappointment at, in every sense of the word. And bounded contexts make vocabularies explicit, reducing confusion. And also, I guess I mean to some degree communication between software systems too, although less so. That is, a socket write is necessarily more expensive than a function call in the same process space. And so microservices impose a natural sort of resistance against the many abuses of intracomponent communication. Uh, service boundaries, in a sense, like good fences, uh, encourage in efficient protocols in the same way that good fences encourage good neighbors, I suppose. So microservices, in this sense, are an immune system response, right, uh, to velocity gridlock. Okay, velocity gridlock, what is that? Well, I think you know what it is. Uh, it's when every PR in your mono repo is this like battle royale with every engineer in the company, right? We've seen these things that stretch on for pages. Too many touch points with too many barely related subsystems all kind of like co-mingling in the same space. Uh, the spaghetti in your spaghetti code or the crossings in your uh, service dependency graph, right? When shipping features becomes dominated by uh, fighting incidental complexity, if you're not experiencing this already and you're not feeling it viscerally, then microservices cost far more than they benefit. So why opt into this architecture? Well, to solve velocity gridlock, right? And when should you adopt the architecture? I'm going to claim in, in two circumstances. One, it's obviously necessary. When it's an immuno response, it seems immediately and obviously necessary. And when there are resources to invest in the sort of infrastructural automation that you need in order to make this viable. So data pipelines, uh, by contrast, uh, they really are just a bunch of data transformations that are kind of glued together. Um, and they aren't typically designed, well, not up front, um, or definitely not the first time, but instead definitely evolve over time. Anyone who suggests uh, doing design of a data pipeline up front is typically and perhaps justifiably met with some skepticism. They are software which spans multiple domains, and we often don't have a complete image of those domains for a fruitful design process. In principle, then, the data pipelines serve to connect these domains. So products uh, grow in complexity to the point in which they split into subdomains to manage at least some of that complexity. For instance, consumer products grow to the point in which spam becomes a serious problem. Instead of mandating that every team handle spam and even data cleaning on its own, uh, spam itself becomes a subdomain managed by a specific team and uh, is then connected by a data pipeline. To enable true collaboration, uh, people depending on clean data need to have some level of trust in the upstream data provider. When they don't, it's far too tempting to implement your own spam filter in your own code and effectively spread little bits of a domain across a code base and potentially even teams. In our metaphor of architecture as an organism, this represents a collapsing of the cell wall and jeopardizes the integrity of the organism as a whole. So thinking about growth and prosperity for a moment, um, we can understand how variance in access patterns uh, leads naturally to new stages in a data pipeline. 
architectures which start off with maybe a single relational database will start to suffer in a very real way when a data scientist starts performing expensive analytics queries on it. One solution, right, would be to isolate uh, that data scientist on part of a cluster. But this is really a short-term solution. Eventually, the tools people use should reflect their explicit requirements and not the ones inherited from the environment. Maybe fortunately, perhaps unfortunately, the big data space is filled with different databases, each with its own use case specific advantages. Actually, in general, we're drowning in choices, and this makes the design process all the more challenging. This fact is even made worse by often the strict divide between people who need databases and people who operate them. It may seem then tempting that, or to, to contribute to or to commit to building some kind of data platform with all the tools and databases that, you know, that the entire organization would need, you know, perhaps Hadoop, a column restore for the data scientist, and then, of course, some relational databases connected to a cloud of microservices. However, the truth is that varying wo workloads don't only imply, but often reveal the evolution of the underlying domain. As this division becomes more pronounced, we must provide richer means for coordination to enable collaboration between different kinds of people. So I know this is a little bit controversial, but over time I've actually grown to, um, to believe it. But ETLs should be owned by domain experts. Like ETLs are ideally the codification of specific expertise into a tra data transformation performed at some regular interval. These domain experts are not necessarily engineers, but engineering might be part of their practice. But what is for sure is these people might have different incentives and priorities than what we might consider engineering incentives and priorities. An ETL can vary from an uh, untestable SQL statement littered with schema dependencies on one terrible side, which I have definitely been responsible for, and then a well-designed uh, MapReduce job with a CI pipeline and external uh, validation. But despite this variety, spurious failures, implicit assumptions, and complex dependency structures are common and make reliability uh, a serious problem. So then, understanding what drains resources away from the organism is essential to an effective design process. We need to look at where things go wrong and we can't limit our view to software artifacts. Instead, we really need to look at the intersection between people, domains, as well as software. Like most software, data pipelines suffer from ambiguity. So ambiguous formulations of correctness, unknown dependencies, and loose no notions of ownership all result in these cases of what I'll call incidental coordination. So of course, coordination must be embraced to enable collaboration but it really should not be a surprise. Incidental coordination can be understood as the result of everything that we fail to automate. Now, this failure can come from lack of foresight, but also lack of insight. On one hand, we uh, fail to plan, so like we run out of space on HDFS. On the other, we miss important details, uh, like how software clocks can actually go backwards in time. In both these cases, uh, a set of collaborators have to coordinate in an incident-specific way, and this necessarily draws resources away from the greater goal of uh, delivery. But by far, what kills uh, data pipelines is actually what kills most collaborative efforts, lack of trust. Unhealthy data pipelines are impossible to trust when the knowledge that they encode is too difficult to verify when teams can't reliably determine when an upstream job is actually going to finish, when the results of the job uh, can't be verified, and when the definition of what correctness is or what a model is or the domain is is spread over way too much software, uh, velocity grinds to a halt. The idea then is to build data pipelines in such a way that we minimize these cases of incidental coordination to make effective use of limited resources, specifically trust. So data pipelines and the domains that they connect require integrity. Proper separation enables effective collaboration. In practice, this means orienting collaboration around immutable events with well-defined uh, schemas and even semantics. Software is actually quite helpful here in providing formal protocols to mediate change, ensure smooth transitions, and even natural evolution. 
data generated at various stages of a pipeline should produce enough metadata such that a consumer can actually assess its fidelity. Uh, this metadata should be a reflection of the underlying domain and be sufficiently rich to allow consumers to raise informed disputes. Dependencies uh, should be modeled explicitly and not naively embedded in a scheduler. Uh, knowing when data is generated is actually quite essential when something goes wrong and you need to perform, uh, recalculate that. Schedulers are quite sophisticated at this point. Uh, but they, they, they fail to model some of the more complex and implicit relationships present in more, comp, uh, more rich pipelines. Coordinating incident response between teams, uh, tracking the provenance of, of data, are all things that you can extract if the representation of the dependency graph is sufficiently rich. But of course, this richness comes at a cost, and knowing when to pay it is uh, non-trivial. So understanding when to invest in better architecture is about understanding some of these signs of friction. When renaming a field in a database prevents monthly reports from being generated, then investing in some kind of schema service or migration tools uh, might be your best bet. When teams don't trust each other because upstream data providers are unreliable and downstream data uh, consumers seem too demanding, then operationalizing dependencies and forming contracts is worthwhile. When a data scientist is coming into the office red-eyed or you know, a little bit confused from performing late-night data repairs, uh, then having a concrete model of data provenance and enforcing the item potency of jobs would definitely help. But what's most important, and this might be sort of the sub-thesis of the subsection of the talk, is to recognize the complex socio-technical dependencies that something like a data pipeline are producing and even navigating. Even if coordination is handled locally, we need to understand health and wellness and even velocity globally at the organization as a whole. Right, so in a sense, in conclusion, uh, we wanted an analytical framework for architectural decision making. A way of answering not just how, which is easy and kind of fun, uh, but also the why and the when. And to do it in a way that acknowledges the natural tensions uh, that inhabit and shape all of these decisions. Managing them, that is, not trying to solve them with a silver bullet, because there are none. We present a model of a software organization as a living organism. The model reveals some important details about the modern enterprise. First, that progress happens in parallel. Second, that resources are presumed to be in flux as teams and projects and artifacts come and go. Finally, that our primary metric, our biological imperative, in a sense, is product velocity and that it's determined by a careful balance of internal and external productivity. We identified two architectures, two structures for our collection of artifacts that naturally emerge in this environment. First, we identified the microservices architecture, the ideal circumstances for it, and the ideal form of it. So why do microservices? Well, the answer is to solve velocity gridlock. When should you transition to it? Well, when it's obviously necessary, and you know it, and there are resources available in the organization to work on automation. How should you do microservices? Well, you should implement services with bounded contexts, well-defined. And you should build uh, autonomous teams arranged in so-called product uh, vertical orientation. So as well as the ideal circumstances for and the form of data pipelines as sort of a modern software architecture pattern, we asked, you know, why do we build them? And the, or principally, it's to enable different kinds of people existing in different domains to collaborate. Now, when do we know that we should actually invest in this kind of architecture? Well, it's when domain expertise varies significantly and that coordination uh, between those teams becomes prohibitively expensive. Now, going back to our favorite question of, of how do we build them, like in the abstract, is with an explicit dependency structure with a richness which actually reflects like the scale of our organization. And in the same way that we need these product verticals for microservices, we need them for data as well. We need to make sure that the people who are selecting databases, operating databases, are on the same team as the people who actually use them. So in all these circumstances, there's been one sort of continual theme, which is that we need explicit boundaries, like cell walls. 
We need them between teams because teams absolutely need autonomy to be efficient and even effective. We need them between software artifacts to minimize uh, touch points and to enable rapid change. And of course, we need them between business domains because this is what allows us to concentrate and to focus and to develop the expertise that our business might need. The concept of, of boundaries follows quite naturally from our analytical framework of software organizations as an organism. As engineers, I hope that it helps us zoom out and in the ideal, make better decisions. So thank you and we're very happy to take some questions. How do we take questions? Can you just raise your hand? Yeah. Maybe it was clear. I see a question, yes. Uh, so you're advocating for, uh, like you're strongly for vertical product teams, um, but how do you counteract some of the negatives of having those vertical product teams, like uh, cost factors and so on? So the question was, we're advocating strongly for vertical product teams. How do we counteract the negatives of vertical product teams? And one example was the bus factor. Uh, so this was Super painful, actually, these transitions to product vertical teams, you're right, it does come with uh, significant friction, uh, but that friction should be put on the product org and not engineers. Um, so we try to tie together this uh, natural process with the need to operate in parallel. So this imperative that says that, oh, we absolutely need to pursue different product ideas in parallel, that might not be true. And actually, if you see this friction or you, you, see, you have a high bus factor or someone is skipping between feature teams so fast that they never develop any expertise, that means that you need to do less things in parallel. There's this concept of um, externalizing your costs, right? And I guess the most, um, the, uh, the example I see the most often is um, like gasoline taxes properly externalize the, the, uh, the latent costs of burning gasoline all, all over the place to the people who are actually doing the damage, right? And so a lot of the effort is to properly externalize or locate the costs, the frictions, the bus factors in the right part of the organization. And hopefully you may do that work explicitly rather than letting it kind of happen implicitly and fall on the engineering org rather than the product org. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, we'll be hanging around a little bit anyway, but thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you very much.